Okay, I call the Brattleboro Planning Commission to order for September 9th, 2015. Uh, this is a public hearing regarding the land use regulations. This is the second public hearing that the Planning Commission will be holding on the proposed land use regulations. Um, we began work on this document on, in May of 2014, and there was a sustained public outreach and comment period beginning in January of this year. We received many comments that helped shape the document that is before the public this evening. We gathered these comments at several small-scale outreach sessions focused to gather input from various stakeholders as well as regularly scheduled Planning Commission meetings. This process has consumed the vast majority of the Commission's time and has been supported by the planning staff and by our consultant, Brandy Saxton. At this second hearing, we will be inviting additional public comment. The purpose of tonight is to receive comments. We may only clarify intent or technical aspects of the regulations. After this hearing tonight is closed, we will consider all of the written and oral comments we have received and make any further changes as we deem necessary. The revisions of the proposed land use regulations will be forwarded to the select board. The authority to adopt the land use regulations rests with the select board. They will schedule and conduct their own public hearings on this matter, most likely in October. This public hearing was warned in accordance with state law. Sue, can you please tell us how this meeting was warned? Yes, um, it appeared in the reformer um, in mid-August. Uh, which meets the 15-day requirement. It was posted um, at three locations in town. Um, we distributed notice of these hearings um, by our uh, email distribution list, which is about over 300 people. And it was posted on the town website as well. Thank you very much. And there was an accompanying article in the Brattleboro Reformer the week prior to the first hearing? Yes. On August the 31st. Very nice. Okay, um, I think we should dispense with the brief overview of the land use regulations because I think the public assembled is familiar with them. Um, we just have a couple of um, procedures for public comment this evening. All persons wishing to be heard, please sign in at the sign in sheet in the front table. Everyone will be opportunity to be heard. All comments shall be made from the microphone. Any individual making comments shall first give his or her name and address. Each person will give an, be given an opportunity to address the Planning Commission. Please keep your remarks brief. I will recognize people in turn. Everybody who wishes to speak will do so before any one person speaks for a second or multiple times. Again, we will only answer clarifying questions as needed. Um, and then before we begin, um, Sue, would you please go over the written materials that have been submitted? Sure. We received um, three new written comments this week um, from public. Um, there's a letter, an email from Adam Hubbard um, that expresses concern about um, whether or not the land use regulations have been simplified um, and that whether or not they'll increase certainty and predictability for development. Um, he also expressed concerns about the different types of zoning that are included in it. And there's a list of recommendations um, that you can read. There are 20 of them, so I won't read them for you. Um, we received an email from Maya Hesagawa, um, who uh, wanted to compliment the Planning Commission on, the job, on a job well done. Um, thought the regulations were organized and will make it easy for the DRB to figure out if the project meets all the requirements. Um, and then there was an email from Pierre and Ellen Cappy um, who expressed concern about the requirement for professional drawings of all projects and was hoping that there could be some consideration to a um, 
some sort of you know setting a threshold by which that would apply. So certain projects under a certain size would <coughs> need to meet so that see. requirement. Okay. I uh, will now entertain any comments from the public. Uh, I'm Michael Bosworth from West Brattleboro. And uh, I do have a couple of questions that might be clarifying questions, I'm not sure. Uh, I just want to say also that although I'm uh, president of the West Brattleboro Association Board, I'm not at all speaking for the West Brattleboro Association this evening. We haven't really discussed the zoning regulations lately, although we're going to tomorrow night, a day late or whatever. But um, so uh, just one comment, uh, the uh, I, I concentrated sir, on the village center and the rural business zones. And I want to compliment uh, the work that's been done because, because I think it uh, from as far as I can see in my personal opinion uh, seems to be what we would like to see going forward so thank you um, I do have uh, two questions again I don't know if you have to answer them or not but the historical uh, overlay district uh, part of which is in West Brattleboro Village um, I've read through that I think well if I owned a building there uh, I might have to do a lot if I want to change anything on the outside are they any tougher than they used to be or is this is this tightening up or or sort of the same as it used to be I, I, I'm not familiar with the old I can't answer that but maybe Rod or Sue can it's it's a new section um, so we didn't we didn't have over an overlay district for historic um, for structures in the historic district, so that is new. Um, I'm just trying to get to the right. part to speak but to I it a little more But I don't believe we clearly. changed any of the requirements. So mm -hmm. I think mm. I think the organization is different. And so. Um, I think the one um, if you're making an exterior modification it actually it can trigger you know review which is not something that that happens now um, so I'm just trying to And then the standards having to meet historic preservation standards. I mean, they're they're kind of um, their guidelines, kind of for their standards. But mm -hmm. th there's some you know movement in there, so they're not they're not so strict. Um, so I think you, right now, if you have a building and you're making is a change to the exterior. You know that that's not something that would get reviewed. Mm -hmm. You might need a permit for it if you're doing an addition or something like that. But, but in this, would, in this situation, it would be reviewed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other question was from the um, flood hazard overlay district uh, on manufactured home parks. Um, sort of the same question. Uh, is that uh, much tighter than it used to, tighter than it used to be? I realize some of this is impacted by recent floods, et cetera. But is that yeah. much of a change? We did not make any changes no. to the special flood hazard area. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's as strict as it is now, or we're proposing for it to be as strict mm -hmm. as it is now. So you still cannot build in the floodway. You can't make a substantial improvement in the floodway, mm -hmm. whether you're a manufactured home or whether you're mm -hmm. stick built. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, for the benefit of the gentleman who just entered, if you'd like to speak, please sign in on the sign in sheet. And uh, we'll be happy to hear the next commenter.
Thompson Road, Whitaker, uh, 267 Western Avenue. Uh, I'm part of a working group uh, that's been looking at the proposed land use regulation since uh, February um, when there was a uh, presentation to uh, professionals that tend to work uh, frequently with the documents. Um, we submitted a number of comments um, back at the July. Um, but, uh, July. July. It was it July? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. A month or so ago, <laughs> and um, we've uh, gone through the comments with the new uh, the new document, and we think that many of our concerns some some were fully addressed. Uh, some uh, I think are adequate. We can live with them. But we still have probably from 12 to 20 concerns that we'd like to bring back to the board this evening. And so uh, the first thing I'd like to do, I guess, is ask the chair, Ms. McLaughlin, uh, is it okay if we present these uh, 12 to 20 uh, this evening? Yeah. Okay. That's what we're here for, to uh, hear your comments. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, look at the map. Um, the, uh, one of our concerns was that uh, the adequacy of land zoned RN for higher density residential development. Uh, we know that some parcels have been added uh, um, to the map since we made the comments and we're grateful for that. There's still two that, uh, that we would like to express uh, concern over because we think they both have a great deal of development potential. Uh, one is the so-called Lock Drew parcel or parcels. L O C K D R E W. L O C K E, and then it's another. Uh, another word, Drew. Family name Drew, D R E W. It's actually, I believe, two parcels of land. You want oh to go yeah. Further. Located right in here. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't we see studied it. this yeah. after yeah. your Can previous you. comments. Hang on, Monroe. We didn't see it, by the way. And I, underst I do understand that, uh, you know, one of your criteria is trying to draw zone district lines and property lines. And in this case, one of those properties is under conservation easement as well. Uh, the part that uh, has been studied in the past. Well, right, I'm sorry, are you talking where, right where the finger is, as it were? Are you talking in here? No, he's talking no. the rural the parcel that's in between the two rural, I the like darker the, green. The dark green. Right, see yeah. Where are we now? There we are, okay. The actual parcels themselves Run all the way down to here. These are the ones bringing no. like that. Okay. The part that we're concerned with in terms of its development potential, because we think it ha is probably yeah. some of the best remaining land in Brattleboro for residential development, is this portion of this parcel, of, this portion of the two parcels up in this area. Okay. Um, and if you might give consideration to either zoning all of those as RN and letting the conservation easement um, if you might give consideration to rezoning both of those two parcels in their entirety to RN and let the conservation easement on the one speak for itself or cut it across from the uh, from corner to corner of the yellow there so that just that upper half uh, would be uh, zoned RN. We think that would have great benefit to the town in terms of uh, accommodating future residential development. Um, and then the other one is um, the uh, the Chase parcel for which uh, a development proposal has already uh, been uh, put forth, I think even approved, for 100 units or so. That's immediately adjacent to Living Memorial Park. Right. Um, I believe that it was approved, but um, expired. it's expired. No, I understand that, but yeah. uh, what I'm, uh, the point I'm trying to make is um, that in the past, it has been studied to the extent 
that it appears to be capable of supporting up to 100 units uh, Go down. Of, uh, of residential development. So we think that, too, could, can play a, right an there, important in role green. in Brattleboro's future residential development. Do you want me to put it on that somewhere? So just wanted to mention those two, uh, those two parcels and, and ask uh, that perhaps you reconsider uh, uh, those two parcels for their value for residential use in the future. All right, we'll take a look. Um, I think the primary thing uh, that concerns the working group is the new plan unit development uh, regulations and the fact that um, the lack of flexibility in use within PUDs. Currently, uh, within the current ordinance, uh, and this has worked to, in my opinion, some abuse in the past as well, but uh, for the smaller parcels. But we would not have grafted cheese today if it were not for the flexibility of ha having a use on that parcel that would not otherwise be allowed within that underlying uh, zone district. The same thing applies to the Delta Business Campus and uh, Commonwealth Dairy. We think that uh, having that flexibility is a vital component uh, to, once again, Brattleboro's long-term growth, particularly in uh, a, uh, an industrial or light manufacturing uh, uh, <coughs> capacity. Um, and um, as we look at the rigs, it might fit in best with um, the campus development PUD if one is not, if you did, I think ideally there would be a, a sort of a multi-use PUD that would provide um, for more for commercial and industrial uses in areas that would not otherwise be zoned for that. Do write down, a, a, you know, a, a, a rigorous review process because not everything that might be proposed would be appropriate. But uh, we think it's in the town's best interest to at least have the flexibility to have something like that considered and be able to be accomplished in a timely fashion. Number three. Okay. Now, those those are the two major ones. Uh, these are just going to these are more uh, design related, uh, te more technical issues mm -hmm. that uh, we still have concerns with, but they're not, I think, as all encompassing and as important as as those that I just put on the table. Uh, the slope requirements for earth excavation uh, for quarries uh, to have to reclaim. Uh, a quarry at slopes of three to one, the state of Vermont allows reclamation to a two to one slope. Um, we think, we suggest that the, the town should uh, have its regulations for that earth reclamation and those slopes more consistent with those that the state allows. That allows the quarry to be much more efficiently operated for more material to be taken out which if we assume that quarries are serving a positive purpose for our communities in terms of providing sand and construction material uh, to be able to operate them uh, in a viable fashion both efficiently um, and get the mac and to utilize that res if we look at it as a resource that we should be utilizing to be able to utilize that resource to the maximum we also think is very important so uh, if that could be, um, particularly the three to one reclamation slopes, if uh, you could consider changing those to two to one so that it's more in line with the state uh, standards, we think that would, if something else would be in the best, best interest of the town. Also, I would point out, we really don't have that many quarries in Bridal World, so in a sense, this might not seem to be too important, but one of the ones that we do have is the public works quarry right across from the high school. 
And so I think at least this reclamation issue should be discussed uh, interdepartment um, with, with the uh, Department of Public Works to see if they're comfortable with that. Uh, that particular pit's a small pit, so it even makes it more difficult to operate. So it, once again... Uh, well, let me just clarify. You're talking about reclamation, not its operation, right? Well, not its operation. This is once it's reclaimed, because what you end up doing is having to not excavate some of the land or bring it in or bring earth in. So um, either of which makes the operation of it less efficient and more expensive. Okay. Number four. Okay. Um, that was four. Okay. Oh, that was four? No, that was, that was three. That was three. three. No. That was three. Oh, sorry. Number right. one had two parts. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My list to go back to later tonight is four. <laughs> We're on the same page. Um, retaining wall parts. Um, limiting retaining walls to a height of 12 feet in the town of Brattleboro because of its terrain and topography also may not be in the best interest of the town. I noticed that uh, when that this section was rewritten and um, it allows for terraced walls. So you can have a wall here, a wall here, and a wall here if you have more elevation difference to make up. But the distance is called for between the two walls is twice the height of the wall itself. So you have 12 feet here, 24 feet here, 12 feet there. As you run that back, you end up with a slope of about one to one. And you can do that with riprap, you can do that with reinforced uh, uh, <coughs> uh, with other uh, types of soil reinforcement. Uh, it, much of the industry of the land that is zoned in the town of Brattleboro right now under the, the current regs for industrial zoning is uh, very steep. And it's going to be very efficient, or, or very inefficient, uh, to have to run slopes up and not be able to construct walls of uh, probably greater than, than the 12 feet. I don't know what that number should be. Uh, once again, because I think the party that's going to be most directly affected by this, other than future development uh, of some of the steeper industrial sites, is basically the town of Brattleboro itself. <laughs> because that's where the current, so many of the current walls that exceed 12 feet in height are located along the sides of roads. So we may be imposing something that will be very difficult for the town of Brattleboro itself to adhere to in the future. So once again, uh, Rod, could you just have that discussion with the Department of Public Works in sure. terms of whether or not, uh, from the private sector, I think we can live with it, but um, that will make some land much more expensive to develop. I'm sure the Bra town of Brattleboro appreciates your concern. <laughs> okay, number five. Okay. Oh, okay, this was one too. Uh, the fueling stations. Uh, we had a, we commented uh, before about uh, uh, it was our feeling that as we looked at the frontage requirements for fueling stations, it was, I think I was close, like 150 feet of frontage. That seemed to be uh, very excessive. And if we look at, once again, this notion of more compact development, more efficient use of land, less pavement, uh, aesthetic considerations, because I think service stations are generally considered to be one of the most unsightly forms of uh, human development that we have in our towns and cities. Uh, we're wondering why have a minimum of 150 feet? Why have a minimum at all? Uh, our thinking was uh, that uh, the less frontage, perhaps the better. But once again, I, I think it's a value issue and one that's appropriately decided by, by the commissioner. We just wanted to, to question that. Very good. Uh, and along those same lines, because I think this does tie into it. Uh, and this may explain the 150 feet in frontage. The requirement that the pumps be placed at the side 
of, uh, of the primary building rather than in the front. The one place in town I can think of where that does occur is Cumberland Farms. And so uh, I guess the question is, is that for fueling stations, is that the standard that we want to apply for service stations in this town? Um, and then this was a small one, but uh, not sure why it uh, exists. There's a separation requirement between residential driveways. And I can't recall what that distance is, but is that really necessary? Should we have uh, a minimum separation requirement between residential driveways? You can certainly see it with commercial driveways uh, uh, and intersections, but residential drives uh, we question. Is that number six? That was six. Yep. Yeah. Thought so. And uh, the next one, we're going to get into the landscaping a bit now. Uh, the, and first of all, the performance bond issue. Uh, if I recall, uh, the applicant has to pl uh, place a performance bond for a period of three growing seasons from the time the planting is installed. Um, I think, and I'm surprised, I don't know if you've, if you've heard from any uh, small property owners, but this seems to place quite a large onus on small property owners in terms of having uh, to put up that bond, or in some cases a line of credit, I know it's been accepted by the town of Bradford in the past, but it basically it ties up their money. They do not have access to that money while it's sitting there for that period of three years. Uh, two things seem excessive to me. Uh, one is the three-year period, and one, and, and the other is uh, the, uh, should the bond be in the full amount of the plant material? Does all the plant material, does it all need to be uh, insured? Does 50%, might it only be for 50%, might it be for 25%? When you talk about the cost and then how you determine the amount to be put out there as well, if uh, a piece of property is commercially landscaped, the cost of a tree, the size of um, which is specified here for buffer plantings and, and front yard plantings, two and a half inch caliper tree, will probably, um, and the maintenance associated with it, and particularly for a three year period, a guarantee for a three year period, is probably going to one tree, $1,000. And if you look at the buffer requirements that you have, you're asking for quite a few trees. Shrubs, you know, maybe 75, uh, 50 to $125 each. So this is a substantial amount of money you're asking somebody to put, uh, to put aside for a number of years. And it will affect their ability, their, their, their ability to uh, uh, use that for, for other, uh, other reasons uh, for the inventory, for other improvements. So might there be some more creative way of dealing with that? It might be something where every year, you know, the, every year more is returned. A smaller amount's put up there initially. But uh, that's something that I think will, will eventually pose uh, a problem or a hardship to small property owners here in town. The landscape buffers themselves, uh, actually you did make a number of the changes that we had recommended there. Um, the ones that, uh, let me pull this out. Was this number eight? Yes. Sounds like it to me. Uh, yes. Thank you. Mm. 
Okay. Um, we noticed that um, the way the matrix was set up, the onus is on one, the party in one zone district as it relates to a piece of property in another zone district. And what we're questioning is why should an RN parcel be, uh, be required to provide landscape buffers with more intensely zoned just uses on parcels within the urban center, uh, the village center, neighborhood center, multi-use, uh, rural business, institutional, industrial, and so on. It, it sort of seems unfair to uh, place that onus on RN properties. Uh, we have the same thing with uh, uh, our art uh, parcels. Uh, uh, buffering is still required on the part of rural residential uh, parcels. Do keep in mind, this is not every house that exists in a rural residential area. These, these are only projects that uh, would require site plan approval uh, uh, within, uh, within those zone districts. Mm -hmm. So it's not like every, when I say rural residential, don't think of it as each individual house. But I believe the trigger probably would be three units. Yes. Yes. This is major site plan. Okay. Um, but once again, the rural residential parcels would, the screening that would need to be uh, put there would be uh, on their dime. It, when they abut the village center, uh, SC service center? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood commercial, institution, institutional, and industrial zone districts. And um, the question whether or not the RR parcels uh, sh should be required to provide buffers with the other re with other residential properties as well, RN. RL, the rural zone districts, which right now they would be, and the uh, WR, the waterfront district as well. Uh, one other thing, and is this number nine? I'm going to let's put all this together under, under landscaping buffers. It sort of falls in that general category, maybe oh. a, a different, okay. different part of that. Um, it's not, well, it does appear to be clear and that landscaping would be required along the entire property line between these, uh, between these uses. And um, we would question, um, or we would suggest that only the objectionable characteristics need buffering. Not necessarily if you have a 1,500 uh, foot property line, that the entire property line would need to be um, be planted at that same level, if at all, if planted at all. If, if, um, so um, if that could just be looked at a bit further, and it, that might be a matter of just rewording or inserting that the sentence to that effect. Um, Oh, lighting. 
Um, I think the way. Okay, so this is number nine. This will be. Does it matter? <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah. You should see me at baseball games. <laughs> and actually, maybe if I can ask a question, because somebody might be able to give the clarification here. Um, I think the way it's been rewritten pretty much serves our needs. We think we're going to have a much lower level of lighting here in our community than would be found in other communities. We also think that that's potentially a problem between existing uses and proposed uses, that they will not be competing on an equal playing field uh, because anybody that's in, with their lighting is in under the current ordinance, their lots are going to be much brighter. The eye is going to go to their properties. Uh, that's just that's just how it will be. I guess we'll have to be. Uh, we can certainly design uh, and provide adequate lighting uh, for the uses with what's been uh, rewritten. The one question that we have, though, uh, is there's this notion of a uniformity ratio in lighting. And what the uniformity ratio is about is the eye uh, adjusting from bright light to dark light, or vice versa, being blinded by glare. Uh, the uniformity ratio, you work to achieve even lighting levels throughout a site or the developed portion of a site. So, and what that does, once the eye adjusts, it can see as well at a lower level as it can at a higher level, as long as everything is uniform. It's always been a critical part uh, of lighting design uh, in the past. And I understand that, that how this is being looked at is different now. But to me, this notion of a uniformity ratio is still vitally important. And uh, I think in our previous notes, we mentioned that the way it's currently being measured is that you have lumens per acre of the site. And the shortfall here, in my eyes, is that everything can be concentrated in one area of a site legally uh, because there is no maximum there. And even a site to be developed, if uh, let's take a car dealership, if they didn't want light to the rear of the dealership but wanted it all out on the street, they could transfer everything to the rear of the site out to the front of the site. Uniformity ratio would uh, moderate that. It wouldn't keep it from happening because you'd have different levels of, of lighting for each each use on the site. But um, the uniformity ratio, um, in my eyes, is a key ingredient of lighting design. Was that given any consideration um, from the previously submitted uh, comments, the uniformity ratio? No, no I don't think it was described in those terms. Could, could no. Brandy be asked about that? Just uh, mm -hmm. uh, She could probably talk to a landscape architect up in Burlington that she's working for, Kathy Ryan, and uh, get Kathy's take on it. Okay. The other thing, um, when we get to, this, to the level of lighting, um, that was always something that was considered at Act 250 as well, in terms of the photometrics that were provided. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, the town's working with a, uh, a different ordinance now than guidelines that, that were uh, originally suggested, and I th as far as I know, are still being used by Act 250 when looking at lighting for projects. So. So number ten. Um, I guess I've lost track. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're talking about it.
for grading now. Grading, did you say? Grading. Okay. Um, and I think our main concern is, um, uh, I'll read verbatim from our comments from before, uh, on slopes between 20 and 25 percent, uh, we feel that uh, uh, the conditional use threshold should be increased to one acre to allow for disturbance or clearing limit of 40 percent uh, of the land in that slope category. Did that comment have a number? Like, did you know? Uh, I could get the original draft that we were working from. Um, it was. From the big table? Yeah. I did the, they didn't number their comments. Oh, never, we, never mind. 3-23. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, because much of the uh, newly proposed industrial zone lands comprise the slopes in excess of 20%. So this, that requirement puts a huge constraint on uh, the uh, developability of those industrial lands, those newly proposed industrial lands. But someone nods with, uh, with one another. So oh, one other thing too. Distinctions between major subdivisions and minor subdivisions. If that could be moved for it somewhere in just for ease of use uh, of the document. Uh, because uh, as we were going through it, we went through it from beginning to end. And we would see references to major subdivision and minor subdivision, but it wasn't until we got into section four. This was all through section three, but it wasn't got until we got into section four that we uh, first encountered the, uh, the definition. And the same thing might be said of uh, major and minor site plans as well. I don't know if, that, I don't know if that's the case with uh, with the site plans or not, but since I'm talking about it on subdivisions, maybe a, uh, it's something you could look into for the okay. uh, major minor site plan review as well. It sets up that standard very quickly so you know what you're dealing with as, as, you're, as you're looking at performance standards in section three. Mm concern is um, street and driveway standards and uh, this is one that uh, Peter Bomek has some major concerns with just because the standards that are being uh, asked for in the new zoning regulations don't really meet uh, best engineering practices for instance, in just as something as simple as elevating, what we term super elevating a roadway around the corner. Uh, this would not allow you, an engineer, to set that at a proper gradient for a high speed, for certain high speeds on curves, or, to, or a short uh, curve, even a, a lower speed. Um, and there are a number of, uh, Virtually everything in here that we commented on previously uh, still remains a problem. And once again, if we're talking with the town, I think the easiest way to resolve this is perhaps if um, Peter and Rod could get together with uh, Steve and Hannah and, and go over these standards so that everybody's comfortable with the standards, I think that would, would certainly solve uh, was all of our concern. And I think that's pretty much it. I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. That was 12. Thank you, How many did you get? Yeah. I got 12. 12. How many were there? That's what he 12. said. Wow. I 12, got but with some subparts. I got 11, <laughs> but that's okay. I can not for them. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay. Thank you, Manor. Are there any further comments? Uh, Michael, I just have a short question. I didn't hear from uh, Monroe. Were you 
uh, speaking on behalf of SDE or some collaboration or uh, or no, it's a working group. There were six of us: uh, um, two engineers, two architects, a landscape architect, and an attorney. That, uh, I have one more. I mean, after <laughs> <laughs> having said all this, I think this is an absolutely wonderful document, and and how the process has been uh, uh, carried out, particularly the transition from the town plan and the goals of the town plan into this document itself. The problems that we have that we've had with this have been mostly the fine tuning of it, not so much the structure. Uh, we have the the one big issue on the use within the EUD. But uh, you can see, virtually all of my comments tonight were on nitpicking design issues. Uh, I will say that the document is difficult to use because of its size. Um, it will take a lot of getting used to it. I'm not sure if a layperson, for instance, can come to this, uh, can pick this up, and do a simple site plan for a commercial use. Uh, but that's sort of the case with virtually any zoning ordinance anyway. I have reviewed other, you know, other zoning ordinances recently in, in terms of how communities uh, are moving. They do seem to be moving in this direction of what I think I would consider to be more complex. Um, our concern, our primary concern is the flexibility and maybe lack of flexibility, more the lack of flexibility that may, well, we don't know yet, we, we probably won't really know until we start using it, the lack of flexibility that may be uh, uh, inherent in this document because it is so so large and complex. So, But I applaud everybody that's been involved in this. I think it's, Thank you, it, it's quite a work, quite a work of art. Well, thank you, Mr. Whitaker. We'll take that as a bonus comment. Okay, so last chance for any further comment. Um, we thank you all for an oh, attendance. Oh, oh, Robert, Robert, oh, Robert. Just jump up. Yeah, uh, Robins, we have old uh, Brattleboro. I just had two quick things, and uh, they're just little architectural things. Uh, one of them was in uh, section 222E to B. Um, it says that a porch has to be 50% of the facade. So I think it's in the, hold on a second, service, no, it's not service center. Um, it's in the village center district. But if you would look at some of the other architectural um, elements that are already within that district, there are a lot that have um, four squares which are just a standard typical house built around 20s to the 40s. Yep. And it, they have like a smaller porch, but it is actually a porch, not just a portico or something like that. So that was, it's just a little, but if someone was keeping with what their neighbor had and they had a lot and they wanted to do something like that, instead of having to go for a variance, it might be nicer to just say like 30% would be a porch as opposed to the 50. Uh, and the, the other one, which, and this is just, um, I'm not a big fan of flat roofs, but in the urban center district, as Ron is laughing, so there are a lot of, um, it's, oh wait, sorry, I apologize, I looked at the wrong part. It's section 223E5, and the lowest recommended roof pitch for New England is, is historically um, a 412, but if we're talking about, um, and I, I understand why this was put in. But if you're talking about um, certain structures less than 6,000 square feet, so 4,000, there's a chance that that could be one story. And having a flat roof would actually be easier to build and probably more cost effective than to have to put a pitch in it um, without having to put like a strange parapet on it. Uh, it would just be something to recommend that maybe in that particular thing that a flat roof be allowable and that those were my two suggestions and then i'm just gonna back away okay. <laughs> thank, you. thank you thank you okay so oh uh, he's back oh, oh. <laughs> 14. Uh, 14. This, 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 this will look as though it's a very serious one but it's not it's, 
not as difficult as it may look. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns that we expressed as well were um, the dimensional standards related to the RN district. And um, the, uh, we looked at the maps online. Uh, we used three criteria to determine whether or not lots are in conformity with, uh, lots in the RN district are in conformity with the proposed zoning or whether they're not. Uh, and there are probably about 10 that we could, that we could have used. Um, the three that we used were minimum lot size, 6,000 square feet, minimum frontage of 60 feet, and all this information is online, uh, on maps online, and then setbacks. And as best as I remember, there is a, and it, we only dealt with a minimum setback here, not the maximum. Uh, minimum setback, front yard setback of 15 feet, side yard setback of 15 feet, and a rear yard setback of 20 feet. Um, there are also setbacks for uh, garages and accessory structures, which we didn't factor into this. But as we did a study of neighborhoods in town, what's in red there is non-conforming in the Oregon district. Uh, this is the area, well, High Street is here, Green Street is here, Cedar, Spruce, and Oak Street. And there's some really disturbing uh, numbers that come out of this. Uh, on High Street, from where the zone district begins to where it intersects with uh, Green Street and comes Western Avenue, there are 42 properties. 38 are, are not in conformance uh, with the new zoning ordinance. Oak Street, there are 30 properties. 28 are not in conformance. Those are two really nice streets. If we talk about the character of our, of our community and, and we, we say what kind of uh, community do we want to have, residential community, those are two streets that we, I think we would cite uh, as examples of what we'd like to have. Uh, Chapin Street, <laughs> every house on Chapin Street is non-conforming. Another me. really nice street. <laughs> Eric, Washington. Oh, hell. <laughs> Nice street. I mean, uh, oh. the property lines are one foot off the back of the house. And, or at the side. This, uh, yeah, that's what I mean, side. The, yeah, the side is really the uh, kicker here. Washington Street, uh, 35 houses on Washington, or 35 properties on Washington, 33 in non Um So then this whole next area here is owned by. Uh, Pine Street, Canal, Prospect, and Main. 78% of the properties were non conforming. The fix is simple. Um, it's what I would suggest doing is um, reducing the minimum lot size to 5,000. Square feet. Uh, maybe you can do a uh, search mm -hmm. just within a neighborhood and find out. Uh, there'll be a few that will not meet that. Um, there's some that are down the 4,000 foot range. But anyway, this, the figure of non-conformance, non-conformance, which is up in the you know 75, 80 percent range. My thinking is that should actually be flipped. You would want to find that probably at least that number in conformance within uh, each zone district. Uh, and this one in particular, because I think this one really establishes a lot of the character of, of the town. Um, reducing the minimum lot size to 5,000 square feet, the minimum frontage to 15. Uh, the, so the side yard setbacks becomes a bit more difficult. I think the development pattern that we, uh, that board easy to write on, is it? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Is there, yeah, there's ten, sir. I was looking at the development pattern in uh, the older areas of town, but we'll frequently 
fine if it says this being a driveway. There being a house here, property line down here, property line there. So on one side, uh, that the houses tend to be very close to the property line, where there's a driveway running to the rear. They tend to be much wider. Some communities use um, a total between the two. And I think what might work well for Brattleboro would be consistent with uh, the notion of a 50-foot frontage, minimum 50-foot frontage. And you take a house width, because many of the old parts of town we tend to be uh, narrower, 24 feet wide, go back deeper. But if we take that 24, that leaves us with 26 feet. If we did seven and a half feet minimum, but that each lot would have to have uh, seven and a half feet here, 17 and a half feet here. So the, the total side yard setbacks would total 25. I think that would turn this degree of nonconformity on its head. So you're interested in a combined side yard to it, fix it, as some, a some fix. communities do that, uh, particularly down on the Boston area. Uh, some of the, uh, uh, I can't remember which ones, Somerville might have been one. Um, but they have an absolute, because they, they have a lot of the same development pattern with a driveway, 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 mm -hmm. where this is, all, and I think actually when, well, our house is like that, and I believe yours too, Eric, isn't it? It's one foot off the back line of the house is the uh, property line, yeah. and the driveway's on the right side, yeah. And that's a, that's a very, if you look in the old areas of town, you, you'll see this uh, taking shape, and this one is always uh, Tight one. the problem. It's a, yeah. It, yeah, hardly any of these meet that 15 feet. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. That's Whitaker. Good. All right. Going, going, gone. Any more public comments? We should get, we should get Hearing none, uh, we thank you for your attendance this evening. And the public hearing is closed. We adjourn the public hearing, and now we're going to call to order the public meeting. Um, and let's uh, approve the minutes of August 3rd and August 31st. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion is carried. Any announcements? Did you have any announcements? Um, I sent out an email yesterday about a rain garden, kind of a two, day and a half rain garden workshop over in Hinsdale. Um, with some speakers and then actually building a rain garden. So um, if anybody has the time and is interested, mm -hmm. it's free. I signed up. I, I really want to go. Yeah. We talked about the rain garden too, obviously. Well, Liz and I will be coming. Yeah, we'll, we'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you have the time, I think it will be I'll good, have you so. come over and shovel and build my rain garden. <laughs> I got a call uh, recently. We can solve it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got a call from somebody in town who wondered if the Conservation Commission or Planning Commission consulted on that kind of thing. So oh, that's it's interesting. About the trip. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's that. The other thing is. Um, they have a green infrastructure, yes, next um, Wednesday. I think it is Wednesday evening. So um, if you're interested, you could check that out too. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, I think I don't have the good times, but I think it's at the co-op. It's five. I'm pretty sure it's five thirty or six thirty. Yeah, at the co-op. And I just have an announcement. I'm on the I'm on the Wyndham Regional Commission appoints members to the Connecticut River Joint Commission subcommittee, <laughs> and we <Keep> usually <laughs> have a group that cleans up the Connecticut River. It's it's part of this greater source to see effort. And the two, we were going to have two groups, one in the Walpole area and one in the Brattleboro area. And both groups looked at the areas that they usually clean and found that they were clean and there was no need. A 
and so we're not doing it this year, but for a very good reason. Cool. It's clean. Cool. So we're back on. Did you put this back on? I did. The lights on again. Yep. All right. Uh, public comment. There's none. Let's move right into the discussion of public hearing comments. I know Sue made a chart from our last public hearing. Sure. Yes. I'm sorry you're just getting it, but literally I was working on it oh, yeah. at yeah. this evening. So before we dive in, can I just ask how we'll be dealing with, since Brandy's not here, and the comments from tonight, like how will yeah, we be I dealing think, with it? I think what we'll do this evening is just review the comments from the last hearing and the comments that we received tonight our staff will be kind enough to digest for us. And then on October 5th, which is our next meeting, we'll discuss them there. And then try quickly to get this to the select board. Okay. Does that timeline work? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, I think, well. I think it's. Theoretically, we would hoped that there would be the first select board public hearing in late September, the yeah. second meeting of September. So. It pushes off the project effectively at least it would two be and a half weeks. Helpful if we could deal with this tonight, and then if we can get a chart in advance of the next one, and then we'll all study it so we could be. Yeah. I have to or warn is you. It? Sorry. That's okay. Some of the information that was presented tonight is going to take a while to analyze, and we are. Um, suffering from colliding uh, work schedules for other projects because we're already late with this. So it's going to be difficult. But um, yeah, we'll have something I for mean, you. By the PUD we've discussed. Yeah, there's some things that are yeah. straight policy decisions. There are some where we have to actually tease out the technical implications or verify the information that was provided tonight. Uh, hope that we would have something to circulate to you by September the 30th for the October 5 meeting. Okay. Something just, um, you know, something like PUD that has been discussed already, um, comments expressing concern about flexibility in use and examples of such you know, projects that wouldn't have been able to happen. I'm assuming that that's correct information, so I don't know. Let me tell you, I'm so glad you brought that's that up. That's what I wanted to bear. Because, <laughs> you know, we've discussed this forever, mm -hmm. and the PUD, you know, as it is now, it includes, incorporates within it a use change. Because it has to go to the select sure. board, and it has to go to the planning commission, and it has to go to the DRB, so it has all this. And our goal was to streamline it. Mm -hmm. And the way to streamline it was to say, if you're not having a use change, it's very easy. Yeah. And if you are having a use change, you just have to go through that gauntlet, which is perfectly normal for a use change in any other scenario. So to say that we're denying them a use, you know, the, the flexibility mm -hmm. is not really true because it's really the same process for use change that you have now. The question about the underlying like, and, and this is something where I just be, you know, if I haven't memorized the whole thing, you know, is there validity to that, like, the comment about the concern that it's not somehow, I don't even understand exactly what the comment was about it, if it's not connected to the underlying zone? No, that, it's not valid. It's not, okay. I just wanted to confirm that because I, I think that it's helpful to get some clarity about, you know, Yes, there are going to be areas that we've already discussed them, but when people come and say, like, hey, I have a concern about this, you know, mm -hmm. it's just helpful for me at least to know, is this something, is this a, is this a concern? Is it going to ruin the town? No, that's not my question. Oh. Actually. <laughs> my question really is, is, like, wanting to also to make sure that we are giving fair consideration to the comments that are coming in. and not just being like, well, we already talked about that. And so I just want to make sure, you know, that's why I'm asking Well, the question. PUD in particular. I mean, okay. we discussed at 
great length yep. in the town plan process and at great length for the past two years. Right, which is why I think it's important just, I mean, you know, and, and I appreciate the clarification because the comment as it was presented indicated to me if that was accurate, you know, a valid concern. So I want to, I want to, I just want to make sure we're not rushing Well, let, for example, the if grafted cheese came up today mm -hmm. or under these new yeah. regulations, you know, they would, if they had a use that was not permitted, although the uses for the PUDs have been expanded. Mm -hmm. So, yes, so in fact, the comment that he said three different places that wouldn't have been able to happen, is that accurate? No. Okay, no. thank you. That was just what I wanted to clarify. And so what the key point here is lost in the criticism being presented this evening and when the town plan was approved and in the previous public meetings, including in front of the select board on the proposed land use regulations. The current system that we work under is not analyzed by these interests and they present the criticism of what we're proposing in terms of a reduction of flexibility, forgetting to mention that the flexibility that they enjoy with the current system requires them to do exactly what it takes to affect a zoning change because that's in fact what it is. Okay. So the criticism of the existing system is that it's overly complex, it's extremely time consuming, it's political and it takes a lot of resources to do, which means they claim that people wouldn't do it. And then when we respond with a system that clearly separates what you would need to do to get a zoning change from what you would need to do to get a PUD, the criticism is the flexibility that we enjoy when we go to write at an entirely new zoning district is lost to us because you're now saying, if you want a zoning change, you should get a zoning change. And if you don't want a zoning change, you're welcome to use the PUD system. So it's, mm -hmm. okay. that's really, and so their position hasn't changed. I feel that we've given them adequate hearing. Mm -hmm. I feel that the select board is familiar with their position. I think that there is an argument that you could make in a different jurisdiction that what they're proposing would be okay. Our response here is to it embodies a couple of things. One is that we think the PUD process is becoming less and less popular over time in um, response to some other shifts in the way planning processes work. But insofar as you would want to use a PUD process under these regulations, the proposed land use regulations, we've developed templates which are responsive to two things. The most common, or the, the, the single biggest projects that we've seen developed as PUDs in recent times. So that includes a campus style development, stuff in the rural, stuff in the rural, you know, with the rural enterprise aspect to it. So that would include uh, graft and cheese. And we've looked at the kinds of sites and kinds of range of uses that we think you could make a coherent argument that the PUD process is the most effective way of processing. That's what we've got. Right. If it was to come to pass that we were missing a template or we could, you could benefit from another template, the system is open enough for us to actually make that amendment. Right. Um, that so question. we think we've addressed the issues, but ultimately it's a policy choice. And the policy choice is pretty stark. It's between what we're proposing mm -hmm. and what currently exists, which there were, this group of people have been extremely critical of what currently exists. Mm -hmm. Also, sure, sure. I just wanted to clarify yeah. if those if those projects could could, yeah, they, could happen under the PUD. That was really all my question was. They, they asked for it to be yeah. streamlined. Yeah, and it is streamlined. Great. Right. Thank you. Breaking out at the exact critical point, which is, if you want a zoning change, then you need to figure out mm -hmm. whether you're willing to take on a zoning change. And if you don't want a zoning change, then there should be a a template, an existing template in this toolbox that's going to facilitate you doing it. Thank you. Yeah. And the uses are greatly expanded. Great. Oh, let's look at this lovely chart here. Yep. Let's start with number one. West of Meadowbrook Road has changed from the 
Well, it's not really clear if this was a complaint or just a seeking of clarification. I think it was put it partly I think a clarification. Yeah, I, I, clarification yeah. I think that by the time the meeting had ended, the commenter had understood that we had to make the change somewhere mm -hmm. along the property yeah. line. So and we chose property line in, in mm -hmm. distinction, distinct from the current right. method, which is distance from the road. Okay. Yeah. And it's really not those that are non-conforming are already non-conforming. Yeah, because I don't they're think under that the there's any right. sort of yeah. effect. Yeah. It was just a comment yeah. without it. Yeah. Okay. I just figured it Number two, 82 and 84 Linden Street. I support that change. I'm good with it. Me yeah. too. Okay. All right. 94 Vernon Street. This, um, this is the Blue Seal building. Um, that is just oh, yeah. south of uh, Marlboro Graduate Center. Does anybody need me to pull it up? Mm -hmm. No. It's just the end of the parking lot, right? Yep. It's the end yeah. of the parking lot. It's, it's kind of like a low I'm fine one. with this recommendation. It's right, it's right by the border. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, I, it's I, on the other side of the tracks. I mean, there's yeah, the tracks. I definitely and, don't. I, I, I feel that people don't understand the, the benefits of the waterfront zone. And. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, and this this is just wrapped up. This 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 is gonna be sacrificed for the new bridge which facilitates better development of the waterfront. So mm -hmm. it's just not a it's just not a Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what's the vote? Is it make Accept the recommendation. Yeah. Yep. Make neighborhood center residential overlay in the existing districts. I don't understand. I probably wrote that wrong. I think he wanted neighborhood center to revert to their old, their existing districts, and put a residential overlay on top of it. I didn't make that very clear. So the assumption or the position of Mr. Lacroix was that rather than making existing commercial uses non-conforming in neighborhood center, he including automotive uses and other things, automotive repair uses. You mean so all those various? Yeah. Zoning districts that we've streamlined. Well, the neighborhood, there's two neighborhood centers proposed. One is at exit one, stretching north as far as um, Fairground and and the Connell Lodge, and then the other one is on Putney Road, taking in a couple of different districts, but basically focused on the area of Putney Road, just north of the Veterans Bridge. And so, in both instances. There's a mix of commercial uses and very little residential. And what he was suggesting was leave all the existing commercial uses in place and then just add a residential overlay. And for us, the key point is um, generally use overlay districts to add a further layer of review and restriction on a use rather than actually open up to broader uses which is a slightly technical thing, but it's important to observe it would be the exact reverse of customary practice. And we actually think that what we're attempting to achieve with the neighborhood center is more than simply adding residential. It's to allow for and focus on, facilitate the development of commercial and mixed use activity that contributes to the neighborhood rather than say in the instance of both Route 5 at exit 1 and Route 5 which is still Putney Road which is you know passing traffic right so that's that's really the effort that's been um, attempted there so I support staff okay I support the recommendation to change mm -hmm. Good. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, number five. Um, this was a very interesting comment. Mm -hmm. um, so, Act 250 currently subjects projects to architect archaeological review? Yes. But Act 250 is only in vote for certain projects, yes. right? Those with existing Act 250 permits or those exceeding 10 acres of development. So, large projects, basically. I think um, it, 
might be something that we can look on in the longer term if, if it's necessary and that we shouldn't kind of stop the process now to include this but in the longer term if there's any modifications that need to be made we can do we can include this at a later time we and discuss document that. I mean um you mean document that we'll look at it in the future or document almost just uh like a like a sort of humanistic consideration of it or an awareness you know what i mean like he like he put something on the table that just wasn't on the table and i understand that like it would be incredibly complicated mm -hmm. and any kind of you know to like i mean well apply yeah. it in but, terms of adding expense to a development it's huge yeah yeah but I still want it to be on the table. So what I'm suggesting yeah. is maybe there's a framing statement or there's just some way to... Well, what would have to be done was, that, you know, when we were considering those subdivisions and we had a whole list of factors like historic or mm -hmm. that, would, that would be discounted from the overall subdivision area, that you'd have to have like a state map yeah, I understand. That's, I'm not even going there. I'm just saying a simple uh, just a general statement. statement. Yeah, at the beginning of the land use regulations that somehow honors that there are things we don't know about the historical use of the land in relation to the Native American peoples that lived here, and that our intent is that people would consider that, and that in the future we will attempt to consider it. You know, just something along those lines to to make some acknowledgement of it. Uh, my, my worry would be if you worded something in a way that um, suggests that somebody should be taking some sort of initiative based on it, that that would like hang up, um, that would hang things up. What uh, what I was thinking if we wanted to do something about it is maybe a. Um, um, an acknowledgement as part of like the purpose statement for why we're undertaking this process, like in order to in order to honor, you know, the past, you know, existing use of the land for however far back it's been used by humanity, you know, that they're taking on this process or something like that. I guess my gut reaction is that I'm trying to think where it's this, you know, discussion of it seems more appropriate for the town plan and mm -hmm. laying out what we think those resources or the, where those locations might be. I'm not sure. I mean, it might be something that we may be able to find some place to put it in here, but really it's just it's more appropriate than the town plan. Yeah. Yeah, do we have a Because this is basically like the law, the land use law for Brattleboro. And I'm, like I said, we might be able to find a place to put in a, a sentence like that or like you're suggesting, but it would have no teeth. And right, I understand. And, and it would, I think it would be, be weird to in here because it, it would suggest, it would suggest, and you have to do something about it, and it would leave uncertainty for somebody who's trying to take action based on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would have it be kind of in the tickler file for the town plan. Yeah, we can definitely um, capture it for the revisions to the town plan. I guess um, I'm trying to think about greenfield development. I, you know, I I don't want to assume that just because. You, you know, live in one of the traditional neighborhoods and, that, you know, there's nothing to discover there. But I think if, if you were going to propose development of a larger scale, I'm trying to think of uh, the conservation subdivisions and other tools that we've introduced with these regulations, whether if you were to pursue the conservation subdivision process, you are automatically also likely to file an activity permit where 
this could come up as a review item, but I, that's what I'm trying to get. So, are there instances where you could pursue a conservation subdivision and mapping provided by the state could suggest the presence of an archaeological site and that, that you respond to that in some way? I just don't know the answer and to I that think, question. I don't know how it works with Act 250 exactly, but I, I am aware of kind of with brownfield sites. So, you know, it's somebody from the State Historic Preservation Office that looks at the site and says, well, maybe looks at historical uses, so whether it's industrial archaeology or whether it's Native American, you know, there's something about that site that they say, oh, we want you to do some research on. So it doesn't, I don't think it applies across the board. Maybe it does in Act 250. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by across, across the board. I mean, I guess what I'm any trying site, to get. Any site that goes up to Act 250, is it, are they going to? Yeah, I think they maintain research? a database and, you know, if it's got a known. Record. They have a database because there's somebody at the state that has got yeah. background. And most business. of the projects right. that are involved in, in Vermont, you have a specific archaeological consultant yes. who looked at the property and assesses it for its likelihood for Native American right. use mm -hmm. because it's right. near a stream or on a bluff or right exactly. And and you know it's it's expensive and it's time consuming and it's quite rigorous. So um, I think we'd have to think long and hard about what we would do to impose yeah. the sort of restrictions on. At this small scale, I support what I think is the staff's recommendation to, to put this on the back burner and not not incorporate it into yeah. the document, but if on there's a yeah. way to track it for yeah, I think the town plan time would like give us time to find some sort of a um, non-onerous way to bring this to the public's attention. I like the idea of it being. Uh, mm -hmm. More kind of addressing the town plan process. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I agree. Right now, this is you know this is the legal document of how things have to go. And we don't have the. And if there was already a map that was you know some sort of overlay district that could, you know that right. we then right. have to decide do we want to impose that. You know, right. But right. But it doesn't seem. It's a on. It seems like, and I think that that was the way the comment was offered. Also, it's, I think in that spirit of mm -hmm. raising awareness and you know bringing you know a, um, it's not like there was a specific like you know could you believe with X right. or Z. So I, I I'm comfortable with you know having the intention of it being something to revisit with the town plan. Okay. Okay. Number six. Wood product establishment. There were a few comments about yeah, there that were. Right there, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, this just says standards should be reviewed again. Yeah. Should we, um, can, can we just talk a little bit more about whether it's true that someone could start up some sort of like manufactured housing process in these areas? So the, the current definition is the key point, and yeah. it does allow a broad reading would allow up to and include the, de the construction of manufactured housing. What page is it? Yeah, it's Maybe we could scale that back a little. So it's page 5 10. The established, an establishment that manufactures wood products other than furniture, such as lumber, plywood, veneers wood containers, wood flooring, wood trusses, and prefabricated wood buildings. Manufacturing may include sawing, cleaning, shaping, laminating, or assembling wood products starting from logs or lumber. Yeah. Um, and, and so this would be kind of a, a rival industrial use that's not in the industrial zone. Well, it depends on, it's a scale question. So, let me illustrate it with a couple of different um, hypothetical developments. So in the first instance, you've got a small property with limited buffering and old agricultural buildings that have been repurposed into workshops and some open space. 
and the construction of manufactured homes happens both inside and outside those structures. So once you've got the general external you know, walls and roof of the manufactured home, then the workers move inside and they complete the work on the inside. And then it is towed away. Um, and then you know you could have a whole kind of production line going of these kinds of things. So that would be, depending on where it was located, you could have a dramatic increase in truck traffic, uh, an oversized load, <laughs> bless you, oversized loads, and um, general traffic associated with the number of employees working at that site. If it's on a dirt road or in a fairly remote location and surrounded by a combination of other uh, rural uses such as farms but also residential uses it could constitute a set of um, activities that need to be mitigated through landscaping and buffering distances for uh, to allow for noise decay associated with the production process and other kinds of constraints mostly associated with the traffic impact the same activity could happen on a farm with frontage on route 9 where the prevailing level of traffic and the number of 18-wheeler vehicles and other noises associated with just that location mean that it's sort of white noise and the scale of that development activity fades into insignificance even though it's on rural, on lands on rural and it's using rural structures. So the question is for us, how and where do you set the line so that if I own a farm, a large farm, with frontage on Route 9 or a major route, where those mitigated <coughs> factors are not going to be so difficult to resolve, how do we allow for that, or do we allow for that? And then how do we provide the DRB adequate review criteria so that if it's the first example, somebody on a quiet dirt road that's engaging in a quasi-industrial activity, how do we ensure that either A, it doesn't get permitted because it's conditional, or B, the impacts are mitigated adequately. That's, that's the element. And the way it was framed in the beginning was to allow for some hypothetical notion of somebody harvesting lumber or timber from the parcel or nearby parcels and processing that all the way through to <coughs> Bless you. Finished, finished sections of a structure or finished structures. The rather than thinking of home, <laughs> bless you, or um, you know construction trails or whatever that is, think of the person that might spend their winter making um, re reproduction Amish sheds or something all winter long because they've got access to all the materials and the time and a barn and they put them out on Route 9 <laughs> with a for sale sign on it versus somebody... Would that be considered a wood product? I mean, like, could that fall into a craft kind of thing instead? I mean, I think that the question really is between industrial activities and, you know, I mean, because that doesn't, what you're describing doesn't sound like a... Right now, the definition doesn't distinguish between those two things, right. and that's and that's that to some extent is the issue. And then there's other things such as, and we'll get into it later on down this chart. Converting a barn into a place where you can have a wedding, um, or can, you know, turning a structure, an existing rural structure, into a, a you know, a, a place where you can have yoga retreats or small conferences or a bunch of those things which are commonplace throughout Vermont and New Hampshire and Western mm -hmm. Massachusetts and could be thought of as complementary to or ancillary to um, a working, you know, working farm or a way in which the working landscape can be maintained because you're diversifying your business. I thought that when this came up in the meeting, I felt like Brandy uh, also responded by indicating that there may be some other um, limitations in terms of like road use mm -hmm. that would sort of naturally. So where you know where if this is on Route Nine, you a certain level of industrial use might 
be established be just because of the nature of moving it off the property, whereas if it was like way back in the middle, mm -hmm. you know, you the road would not be up to code to be able to like move it to that weird, level or not. Well, there's a, re there's, a, <laughs> there's a weird distinction there between overweight and oversize. So it turns out that homes, modular homes, don't weigh very much at all. And so they're oversized, but they're not overweight. We rate our roads for capacity and could make arguments about what kind of uses could happen on those roads, not on the basis of oversized loads, but on the basis of overweight loads. Okay. And so well, restrictions around mud that. season and those kinds of things, where they shut the roads to large loads uh, because of the damage that they do to the road in mud season, which would, you know, so that would conflict with your ability to run a business. It's associated with weight, not size. Mm -hmm. So could we ask, um, could we ask Brandy to recommend um, a wording change that would clarify and distinguish between like heavy industrial use versus yeah. the guy making Amish sheds. It's <laughs> probably not Amish. But, yeah, I did say reproduction. For, okay. for yes. Right. I mean, I'm sure he's going to use a power tool pretty much any moment. Well, yeah, particularly on. <laughs> would just say the materials must come off the, the property? Would that sort of limit it up pretty good, or is that too it, tight? I, I, you know, that that's not an invalid response. I think it might be overly restrictive I mean, if you're going to get into laminating and those kinds of things. I think what we're really trying to do is foster some kind of sense of. Um, fairly sophisticated small businesses engaging in high-end construction, but on a pretty small scale. Yeah. And whether that's viable or not, or even reasonable to think could or should happen in rural settings, I don't entirely know, to be really honest. I mean, I know where this whole thing came from. Yeah, and, I'm sure you uh, do. The person that um, is one of the abutters um, is working for me, so I've heard a lot <laughs> about it. So. Uh, and, um, Can you tell? No. <laughs> let, me answer, let me answer for Eric right now. I've heard too much about it is the That's best good. way to put it. Yeah. Um, but sure. I understand, uh, you know, setbacks and things on an issue. If it's like in the middle of a farm, that's one thing. But if it's close to right. a bunch of neighbors, that's the big issue with the whole thing. Yep. Yes. And so I think there needs to be something in that whole issue to um, take care of that. Isn't that in the conditional use reviews, though? I mean, in the, in the major site plan review that would be required on a conditional use, wouldn't that be, I mean, wouldn't those things like yeah. traffic impacts and noise yes. impacts and those kinds of things be addressed within those regulations? Yes. I would think so. I mean, that's what this comment says. But I think we should just, I think that there might be a need to tweak the definition as in I do so too. That the, I think if we can figure out a way to change the definitions of the less industrial sounding, I think that's like yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've got some direction. Right. Change definition. Standards. And review standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. And given that we have to come back to you, it, it will be difficult if this is the only thing left on the to-do list yeah. tonight. Yeah. But for one reason or another, it's not. So, yeah. At 5.35, when we hit print, we, we were hoping that this would be maybe yeah. the only thing on the to-do list, but we were wrong. Okay. Exhibition, convention, and company structure in the world. So kind this is related. like part B. Yes. Uh, number, number seven? seven. I know, I'm just teasing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, by the way, number 13 started out as a compliment. It was like an Oreo, and then you looked at the middle man and was like, ooh, what was that? <laughs> what? Who ever says worst. that about an Oreo? Everybody looks at the middle part. Well, the good part. I think that's Let's carry on. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm going to change this. I'm good. Okay. Thank you for bringing us back. <laughs> was was air transportation not conditional in certain zones? Was yes, that allowed. It was okay. only conditional in urban center, service center, and um, institutional and uh, rural, city so, industrial. I agree with the change to making it conditional in all. 
Yeah. I mean, we think that a runway is probably very unlikely. Well, we think but helipad. you could get a helipad. Well, we think helipads are a reasonable assumption, you know, for institutional uses, for instance. So. Or really wealthy. Or if anyone wants to buy course. aircraft, please contact me. <laughs> Uh, that's right. You have some expertise in this regard. It's okay. intriguing. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Fitness, sports, gym, or athletic club is not a key. Oh. That's right. I think that people who are exercising in rural zone districts should be wearing lumberjack clothing and not doing those other you things. You want a weekend? Yeah, it should be me on the weekend. But what, I mean, seriously though, I mean, if, if the goal of this is to allow for rural style athletic facilities, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. horseback things mm -hmm. and um, shooting ranges and that sort of a thing, it seems like perhaps that should be stated as opposed to saying, you know, I, I could, I, I think that having, for some of the same reasons that we don't have, um, you know, other, um, high traffic in a gathering places in rural districts, I think it makes sense to limit the sort of, I mean, obviously we want to allow for like a horseback riding facility in a rural zone. So are you <laughs> thinking, so, I mean, but not horses. like a, but not necessarily like a, a, a weightlifting, weightlifting gym. gym. Like, so, <laughs> so would you, I mean, I think that we could, we could probably footnote this in the rural, that you know, like we've done that some place, other places in the table to make it yeah. clear that it's mm -hmm. the outdoorsy, record, you know, rural yeah. type, non-structural. Yeah. Are the conditional use criteria general, or are they specific to this use? They're, no, they're general. They're general. Yeah. So a footnote to be more specific about the criteria would probably. Be you mean, that, I was thinking really just more specific like about it. for the DRB in their kind of analysis of the conditional use. And to the developer. Really, yeah. So that I is To the reader of the document in the first place, yeah, yeah. right. I think yeah. within the LCBS, because I was kind of researching around, that's, that's, that's the, the land classification mm -hmm. code, um, which is where we've taken the uses and the definitions. Yes. I think there is a subcategory that gets down to like outdoor recreation. So yeah, let's we could try to tease that, that one way. Out. Great. Great. Okay. Number ten. If it's pouring when it's moving, if anybody's driving that way, let's be right. Yeah, <laughs> I'll give up this I think I'm already full, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Fitness, sports, gym. Um, oh, this is in the residential neighborhood. I'm good with that. Yeah. Yep. I wouldn't mind being able to walk up the street and work out. I mean. The viability of a place is going to be determined by the You could have a little yoga. I mean, there, actually, there was recently like a yoga studio like that was put in. Like the club at the tennis club. Yes, that was yeah. that we, what yeah. we had in mind. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. everyone's okay with this? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> and I don't remember. I don't remember that. Either. No, these these some of these it's came from our, our zoning administrator. So uh, he, would just, he would just fire off. He would fire off emails. So I didn't. I have them. If you would like to see. So them. these are like, like, pair, you know, like these are like ringers. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah. These are light. They're very light to the party. Not all. Just the way I organized it. Yeah. So um, the open market does include flea markets and. Um, we do get quite a few complaints. So this is saying okay. that what occurs now should change to be more restricted. Yes. I'm, a, I'm all on board on that. Well, okay. On the basis of the definition, mm -hmm. right? That's fine. Right. Brandy might have to, we might have to have her smooth this over a little bit, but you get the idea of what we're, where we're trying to get. And we would like to establish the definition of bid bug market. So, so as it is, these aren't permitted in residential. No. You need a ride too. <laughs> I can, I can <laughs> give rides. Thank you. I'll have one question yeah. once we get yeah, out of the so it's not very useful for you guys. Sorry. <laughs> I have a funny story afterwards. Okay. Okay. Right. Conditional use triggers major site plan review. Okay. 
Okay, the suggested change for this was really confusing to me. Commence in a conditional <laughs> use, not a change from one conditional use to another. <laughs> this was Brandy's suggested huh? change. <laughs> they are of the same or lesser intensity. Would it, would it would be like that? Do you want to do your drawing? Oh, okay. That's going to do a drawing. Please, throw away. Susan invited me to draw for one, so this is good. Okay. So. Don't be too professorial. <laughs> be a concise I wanted, I wanted a slightly smaller sketch than this, so we could really take it in. Uh, okay. I like that sketch. That's not the way. It was. It was a good sketch. So if you think of the zone as, like, when you're right on it, if you've got a house and you're in a residential neighborhood, it's a permitted use. You know, right in the bullseye of what that zoning district is supposed to be doing. If on the other hand, I don't have enough colors. If on the other hand, you have a conditional use, you're not in the bullseye, you're not in the center of the zone for that zoning district, right? You're already like stretching. The you're out there. You're out there, you're stretching the purpose of the, and the definition statement of the zoning district. If you want to go from here, with a certain level of existing intensity to out here with even more intensity, so that would be increasing the intensity, then this gets you major site plan review. So what, what's the distinguishing? If you want to go from here just to another conditional use, so if you're, a, and I'm going to pretend that these actually are conditional uses, if you're going from a hairdressing salon to Office. to an office and you're not changing any level of intensity with your conditional use then you're good right you don't it's, get it doesn't constitute a major site right. okay, here's the place where I'm concerned but if you go from here to more intensity then you get a major site on sure Would you? this is the place where I'm concerned about major site plan this first one the permitted yes one. because this is the place where you get small business owners and I will say you know you know, full disclosure, like I did this myself. I went from a house on Western Avenue that I wanted to have a human office. Had I had to go through all the stuff that we are proposing, people have to go through, I would not have been able to open my office and hire the five people who were working for me. And I know we've gotten a lot of comments about this, and this is about a lot of different, you know, we're hearing this from a lot of people who are big developers and developers of bigger scale projects in different places, but I'm really concerned about small scale entrepreneurs in this town being really impacted by this major site plan review standards and requirements that will be covered. So I just want to say that both as, you know, just a member of this yeah. commission, but also like, well, now, aren't and this there is really problematic. Yeah. Appropriate to that, aren't there places on Western Avenue or whatnot that are zoned for office as a permitted use? Yes. Yeah. And, and so if that's the case, if you live or if you owned a property, where converting from residential to office was permitted it's not, use. But it's not. It's not as long if you're not living in the house. It's a conditional use to change it from a residence to, like in my case, an office and a residence, which is not a, an owner-occupied residence. That was a conditional use, and I had to go through the whole year. Right, but there must be places where it is a permitted use and mm -hmm. not a conditional use. Yeah, I mean, and it's not like there's such a huge option of offices to, or places to buy to, to open a small business. I just think that the comments, I know, I, I know I feel like I'm like the big voice for small business on this commission, but like, I think. Yeah, well, you are. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing great. I just want to. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. I want to say though that I feel like there, there is. It's very easy because it's not convenient, and it doesn't fit neatly with our goals. Some of the goals, you know, and the. the it's much easier to to be more restrictive, and you know, it's and and it's easier to have all the to have it all laid out so that we can protect the town. Yeah, and I, I and I want to support that, and I also and I want us to take seriously the concerns that are being brought to the commission. And, you know, like, I know some of them are on a scale where, you know, I'm like, okay, at some level, you do really need to have all those reviews. You need to have the professional drugs. You need to have the professional landscape and lighting, all those things. And for people who are doing small businesses, which is, you know, 
a lot of how the, the growth and economy of this place works. I just don't want us to be overly restrictive so that people feel like they just can't do it. Like, it, it's a leap for most small entrepreneurs to start a business and to take that leap. If you add on, like, you know, another significant burden, you know, it's kind of like the note that we got from the cafes, like, about how they started. It's, it's, I just, I just want the commission to take this seriously. I think yeah. it's a really big issue. I have just two comments. First, you know, a lot of our concern stems from the fact that, you know, if it was a residence and there's residents all around you, that those residential uses need to be protected from what may be transpiring next to them or adjacent to them. But at the same point, it surprises me that there isn't a zone where this is already permitted. This is always a conditional use. Well, I mean, there's the, it's permitted in mixed use, it's permitted yeah. in neighborhood center, but in the residential. Okay. It's always been a concern. I mean, I didn't say we as talk as in <laughs> other meetings about having a threshold by which it would still be a conditional use, but it would not be considered a major site plan? No, that's, I think that's where we're at right can now. Can we, right. can, that's, that's where, we that's are where we're going. Yes. I think that's where we're at. Yes. I think, I think that's what this adjustment it, it attempts to do. So. Which and I don't and it see it. I don't think it's sufficient. I don't think it does. When we talked about it in the office, and maybe it's not, not conveyed conveyed properly, but we were less concerned about the move from a permitted to a conditional. It was from one conditional to a conditional use of right. more intensity. So maybe you have a shop now, and now you're going to go to a bar, mm -hmm. and you're going to have it's going to have hours that are open later, and it's going to you know. Right. That kind of thing. Which is what that diagram attempted to represent. And right, but I don't think that that diagram and that dis and this, these words here are Rachel's. No, they're not. They're slightly different from Rachel's concern. Rachel's concern is actually they're significantly different. Yeah, yeah, Rachel, <laughs> Rachel's concern is in the middle of the diagram, which is how do you get popped from you know from going from permitted to conditional and requiring a major site plan yeah. at that point. Yeah, so let's tap so that. I, this is so I understand this. So the way you worded this, you're really giving the jurisdiction to the administrative officer to make the call if something needs a major site plan review, if it's moving from like conditional A to conditional C in their view, right? Mm -hmm. So is that correct? But there's a hierarchy of uses that he will use, Definitely. he or she will use to define that increase in intensity. Right? Well, so then can't, couldn't that also then, that jurisdiction, I guess, also then be applied to moving from a permitted use to a conditional use where... Yeah, well, I think we've talked in the for, before that it's easier to set like a, some sort of threshold number either a square footage or yeah, I think we talked about square yeah. footage. Well we do like have we do have those thresholds. So if you're right if you're not con concerned about the change from a permitted use to a conditional use that doesn't require a new principal building, is not a substantial renovation, doesn't add parking or impervious, you know, over the threshold. So there's no change that would not change parking or have a renov I mean like it basically there would be, I mean, it's very, again, th this is where I think that it's a little unrealistic to think that we're not going to be severely thwarting small entrepreneurs from starting businesses. To say, if anybody is having a business, most most people are going to have some, some change in traffic, like this some, some, some number of visitors of, of par some okay, change so in parking, or some kind of renovations. I mean, that's I don't know what, what the answer is. I is. just think that this is this is a real issue, and I think it's really been it's it's it just seems like the commission's been we've been like just trying to sort of set this aside or pretend that this isn't really an issue because I don't think no, that's fair to say. Right yeah, I was like, like here, yeah, I'm gonna hear one suit. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there is leeway. So if if the change from a permitted to conditional use is not doesn't make a fuss for anybody. Then the other triggers would be, you know, if you're building a new building. So say you're, a, you know, you've got a permitted use, you want to go conditional, and you're going to have to 
build a new building. Well, then you're making site changes. Maybe you should come into sure, you could compliance. Yeah. Um, if you're substantially renovating the existing principal building, which we have as improvements at more than 50% of the building's assessed values, that would be, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a big improvement if you hit that. Um, construction of more than 10 parking spaces or 2,000 square feet of impervious surface. So the um, former auto repair station on Western Avenue that changed into the a hairdressing, hairdressing salon. They actually did add parking, but they would have been under the 10, 10 parking spaces. So that wouldn't have, that wouldn't trigger major site plan review. They did a great job. So that example, is that something that was considered a major, would be considered a major site plan under these regs? I would say no, because no. that was a conditional use of an auto repair shop. Of their building, then. But they reduced, but they reduced the intensity of the use of the site. So it went from one conditional to a different conditional. Yes. Right, which, which was, was less than less. Yes, exactly. No, it is true. I mean, under the reading of this, yeah. we don't know how much they put into it. If, if it was more than 50%. The building probably sure. wasn't worth a whole lot to start with, so it's probably fair to say that they triggered 50% of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. They could have. Yeah. It's hard to know. I mean, just, the, you know, the extra plumbing and the, just the finish work inside would have, because it was a fairly bare bones structure, it was just a gas station, so it was a, okay. you know, one tiny little office and a bay for working on, and now it's, you know, it's a hairdressing salon, so there's lots of extra work that would have pushed it, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about the example, I just say that I'm most familiar with, which is my, you know, yes. purchase of my house, which is, was turned into an office, which was a conditional that changed from a primary residence to an office and a residence, which would have triggered a major site plan review for this, right? The way it's written now, yes. The way it's written now. Yeah. Okay. But yes, there are, have. aren't there locations where you can have a primary residence, uh, a residence and an office? That would be a mixed use. Yeah, mixed use. Yes. In the mix yeah. use. So, so within say, the mixed use. Well, yes, you so can, your concern is because yours is in the residential I'm not zone. concerned about my property. No, 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 I'm, I'm just saying. That example. So, yes, that I mean, example. So, so I will say, when I decided to, to expand and create a business, I looked for suites to rent all over town for a long time. There were none. None. So then I started considering buying a property. And I found one that seemed like an appropriate fit for my business. It is not like there is a huge availability of options for people who want to start businesses. Literally, like there was not a suite to rent in the entire town. Okay, so it's not like there's like oh well, just go find a house in mixed use. It's not that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned about us being excessively restrictive and creating financial. Um, I mean, I, I want us to have good, solid regulations that are going to help us to have protect our neighborhoods and have the kinds of structures that we want. This, so, is, this is a real, it's a real concern, though. And what, do you have a, what, would, do you have a suggestion for, like, what you think? I don't know. I mean, I'm hope. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if it would be, like, a, you know, a dollar amount that seems, because, like, who knows about inflation? I mean, like, this is a, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't have an answer. I just, it, I, I don't know what the answer is. So, so, when, we can come so up with in the group, mixed use you know. zone, this is not a problem. This is only a problem in the residential. No, it could be a problem in the mixed use. I mean, so any conditional use going to another conditional yeah. use in the mixed use, it, it would be a problem. I mean, setting yeah. aside the example. Mm -hmm. Well, that, so that's so, what brings me back to the decision being made by the administrative officer. So if you're giving him leeway to make to essentially make a judgment call between two different types of conditional uses with the set with possible impact changes and impacts, then why wouldn't he also or he or she also be able to make that call between a permitted use and a conditional use if you're trying to make a judgment call on an impact change? Well, I was thinking that permitted to conditional wouldn't trigger a major site plan. Um, and then all, maybe these it other wasn't things. And these other things. Just, right. I think that's a really good solution. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd be fine with that. Do yeah. we all like that? Yeah. Say it again. The conditional, the changing, 
from permitted to conditional would not automatically trigger a site plan Wait. review. It would only trigger a site plan review if there were major site plan. Major, major site sorry, so you still need to do a site right. plan. It's a different but process. It's a minor minor minor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're proposing. Like rebuilding the building or like. Yeah, right, which are so all like So those threshold or, elements are in the definition. That I think would be not the a really good solution. Would you say that for all changes between um, Yeah, exactly. All permitted to condition in all districts. Well, we but then what about conditional, conditional to conditional of well. a higher intensity? Right. I think conditional to conditional with a higher intensity should get major site plan. Yes. And is there a definition for higher intensity? That, uh, there is, right? There's a hierarchy. Right. There's, There's a ranking. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, it, then it's up to the zoning officer to determine. And so. you know, there's that process. There's that due process built in, which is you don't like the decision of the administrative officer, then you get to appeal it to the DOB. Right. So. I think that that could be a really workable solution of yeah. just having it so that that first key to see doesn't necessarily trigger the interest on its own. Yeah, I think that we need. Great. I think that needs to. We need to figure out how to, that that's clearly conveyed. But that's what kind of the. We spoke earlier today. That was the direction. Right. Is there okay. is there a um, so if somebody went from permanent to conditional and a resident who wasn't who was in the neighbor didn't like it, is there a is there some sort of recourse for that? They can appeal. They can appeal. It to the development review board. Right. And so it still gets so. a hearing. Minor site plans do not get a hearing. Right. They do they get a letter to the voters? No. They get a big red P sign. A voters would still get notified. Yes. But and under, under minor? If it's not sure. it doesn't get before the DAB? I, I would think so. We should we should confirm we that. should confirm that but yeah. I mean it's that site plan review and site plan review requires I mean how does somebody know if they're an interested person right. if they don't know what's going on right exactly that's what I, that's what I was getting at and that's what I was thinking that's why I'm glad Kate brought it up because one of the there's two things that we're weighing here yeah. and it's always complicated and so on the one hand we're weighing the ability of people. you all right yeah, okay. yeah I just, I just, uh, yeah. <laughs> Were you just electrocuted? Is that what you're saying, or is it just loud? Just Picked it up and ran it. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Camera's not the. Is that incorrect? Um, that dog's gonna come in here and wonder what the heck you're doing. Is <laughs> <laughs> your dog in the car? No, he's in my office. Oh, he <laughs> 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 Watching television. <laughs> um, so, um, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> the needs of the neighbors and the right. Yeah. So the, the interest of the neighbors and, and and the property owner and and their intention with each other and so where which gets back to this diagram when you're playing inside the the red zone and it's all permitted then there's an understanding shared by everybody that it's all okay. Yeah. All right. When you start doing things that are a little outside the red zone, then people. Butters and neighbors have got a, an interest in the outcome. And I would have to say, I acknowledge what you're saying. I think that the experience from case law and from outside of the deal here, which is receiving and processing complaints, is that things often start off very small and with good intentions, and then they grow. And they grow in ways that everybody was less able, you know, less likely to predict. And even quite established institutions that are large and making a really good contribution to the broader community can find themselves in tension with the neighbors because their interests are now no longer the same as the neighbors and the hospital actually would fit into one of those institutions that really pushes the broader neighborhood's ability to accept what they're doing because it actually does manifest as challenges to their quality of life in terms of noise and interruption and a whole bunch of things so where we draw this line is really important and how arduous we make it for the applicants is also really important notwithstanding your comments about the general market for rental you know office space or a whole bunch of other things and, and they're important but I do feel before we confirm one solution or the other here that 
we have to give some due um, consideration to these to the flip side, which is okay. It was okay when it was just three people working in an office, you know, in an existing house with everyone parking, you know, in their driveway. Now it's 15 people working in that small house and they're parking all over the place and, you know, I'm, I'm impacted. Can I ask you a question about that then? Sure. So my question for you is, how would requiring all of those, you know, like extensive drawings and landing plans and all of that speak to that? Like if you have, if you have a business that starts off as a small, like, and that's what the, that's what the plan would be getting drawn up for. And say five or ten years later, it's a different business, right? And it's outgrown its space, or it's outgrown its you know location, or whatever, and it's impacting the neighborhood, or it's the hospital, and it's that on a much bigger scale. How does does creating these very expensive requirements up front for a very small business prevent that other problem, which is a problem? I'm not saying it's not, but I just I don't see necessarily pricing out a very small business because someday they might be a large business. You know, they're not going to be able to predict that necessarily anyway. I mean, you've given, you know, over the various meetings, various examples of that small thing that then turned into a big thing, which became a problem. But that doesn't, this, that this habit, triggering a major site plan for a plan for a small business doesn't fix that problem. I think there are different issues. So I just think it's important not to get them conflicted. Well, it does conflated. fix it in the sense that the neighbors can rely on the work that was done initially and complain right. and then bring that to the attention of the zoning officer who will, um, what do they do to the, <laughs> to the honor of the well, it's, 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 it's violation. It's grounds for a violation notice but, and they issue a violation notice. I think yeah. I just think that they're two kind of two different issues. I think it's important not to get them to. Uh, yeah, but they're, no, they're related. They're related, but they're the one they, forms the yeah. basis for the future right. violation. And but then there's still a, they, I mean, there's still a site plan review. It's not that there's not a site plan review. It's just not a doesn't require a professional landscaper and well, lighting designer. That's all. I mean, I think still, that's the issue. Right. Where I'm where I'm concerned is okay, conditional uses. I think the reason they fell under major projects is because there should be a public hearing about it. When you look at the minor site plan mm -hmm. review, that actually is not. It's kind of right. the department heads, as the technical review committee takes a look at it, makes recommendations, and the ZA can sign off on it. Right. I'm concerned about taking conditional uses out of having um, yeah, you know, a public hearing because I think that that's problematic from the neighbors' well, perspective. You know, even if they get notice, what it, it makes me uncomfortable. Professional, like, and I think under state law, actually, so, it yeah, might so be required we, we to have a hearing. We talked about at one point, I think, about um, reducing the cost burden of having to have the professional experts come in for projects of a small size. So maybe I think, we need I think like maybe we a need small, to medium, and large, <laughs> or permitted <laughs> instead of family size. Yeah. Instead Super of sizing. you know something in the middle that has a the public hearing, threshold. but is under the threshold that requires a yeah. litany of professional I, services. I like that idea because I think that having the public hearing is important. Yeah. actually, because I because think, yeah, I, I, I even when I think about like my project, I'm like. There should, you know, nobody it came and complained. Be transparent. Like, it should be transparent, and the neighbor should have a have an opportunity. And the part that's concerning is is more the cost the burden cost and burden. the the requiring that everything be done by a licensed landscape architect and a professional lighting designer, and you know that that and it's it and I think that that there was a letter we received today that really spoke to that too. You know that people need to be able to bootstrap a new business, and as long as they can present that in a way that meets the requirements of the application, mm -hmm. I think they should be able to do that. Let me say, I think we're more interested in seeing the information delivered rather than the stamp of the person that's delivering yeah, the information. I agree. If they can meet the criteria. If they can meet the criteria. And, I mean, that's, I think and that that's we've important. talked through in previous meetings with Brandy how, in fact, if as a property owner you were to go to the local nursery and ask for advice, it's entirely acceptable that the nursery person who's got a form of certification can say, 
yeah, this is an appropriate plant for the buffer. It's not going to grow too wide and it's not going to grow too tall. It's, you know, yes, if, you know, this rudimentary sketch with identifying the species of the plants is fine for, you know, I've looked at what you're looking for from this document. These plants fit that description, that need. The same stuff with uh, the lighting plants. If if you buy fixtures, you can access the information about the performance of the fixtures. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as arduous as, as some of the comments make out, but I feel that it's important to acknowledge that it's not, like I said, the professional stamp we're looking for, it's the content, the quality of the content that we're looking at. I should let you know that part of the response also there is Sometimes we just yearn for somebody who's used a ruler to draw a side plan. Okay. Sometimes we really like it if they've written, "This is my house" <laughs> on the plan, rather than something else. Sometimes we, I am talking like this stuff doesn't meet the back of a napkin threshold. Okay. Yeah. So I think that my I think that the addition on my house was is literally on a napkin. Yeah, so I think it might be. <laughs> Before we bought the house, right? so I was like, yes. wow, that's so interesting. On file? Yeah. What it, you it's like file a what torn you get. piece of paper. Right. And, yeah, like, and I, yeah. I totally get that. Right. And it's still oh, it's not mean, the Gettysburg Address? And it's still right. like, and you, so there's you know, this, so there's this thing. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Right. So this overburden is, small entrepreneurs right. because of that. So we're now adding another category? Well, I think, I think that I need. And if you're comfortable, right. maybe we can come back with some suggestions. Right. Yeah. Because, great. I mean, I'm, I'm uncomfortable moving everything into minor site plan because I do think public hearing Easy is a requirement for conditional use. But so how do we how do we deal with the Or could you do a minor site plan for conditional use that require, you know, but when it's conditional use, hearing. it also requires a public hearing. Well, yeah, I mean, like chat about yeah. it with Brandon. Yeah, anyway, just, just another idea. I think, right. guys are, I think, yeah, I think we, we get the thrust of where you're coming from, and I think that what we're trying to do is balance the yeah. needs and interests of the abutters with the applicant. And sure. it's not intended to just make it yeah. prohibitively expensive and difficult. And I don't think, don't think the purpose even of the major site plan at that point is to... Well, it's never the purpose of it. Right. Yeah, but you also have lay people reading it, and they might just shut down and be scared because the language is enough. That you know, like short of coming sure. to your office and having a nice conversation with the really helpful planning staff. You know, I mean, you I may lose right. people who never come in the door right. because of right. Yeah, I'm a pretty like you know relatively smart person that can figure things out, and I was pretty intimidated by uh, by the old process. And this one is like ten. It feels like and just reading it seems significantly more complicated. So. Yeah. Or, or cumbersome anyway. So, thank okay. you for bringing right. that up. Projects okay. of the so, so should not be required to provide professional drawings. I think we just dealt with that That's one that way, way or another. Maybe it'll come back. Okay. 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 I don't understand number 14. So, can you explain what that comment is? So, um, this came from Dennis Smith. Um, I kind of teased out from what he was saying. So, he was concerned under the frontage standards in, in certain zoning districts, it requires that any pre existing parking, storage, or display be removed from the minimum front setback. Remember, he thought this was 40 feet, but actually in the neighborhood center, the minimum front setback is 10 feet. Yeah, and in the, the other service thing center, is it's 20 feet. And I think he also misunderstood that this was only if he was conducting some new work. He's not, it's not going to right. retroactively. Right, it doesn't right. matter retroactively. Yeah. Right. What I would say is um, there is a section under the parking standards that basically gives you that out if you've got certain physical and site restrictions, you know, so, that would yes. say, you know, look, we really want it out, but we realize that there are some, if you're a previously developed site, it might not, it might not work. So there are existing businesses for instance, that only have access to parking in the front of the lot. They don't have side yards and they don't have access to the rear of the lot. And so that's pretty apparent. And so under those circumstances, we wouldn't be going, we would no go, oh, you. okay, I guess that's where the parking's gonna have to be then. I like this right. language edition. Right. Yeah. What is SFHA? Special, Special flood, flood hazard. hazard. Sorry. No, yeah. <laughs>
Um, and so these uh, these next three came from the zoning administrator. Right. We've had some recent problems with getting elevation certificates after the project is done, and they don't meet the requirement. And so that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, so he, he recently attended a training. <laughs> he recently right, yeah. attended a training, and this is going to yeah, go Well, we're all for that. Real, go for it. Yeah. Really okay. give you a headache. Next. Yeah. Um, um, so our flood regulations are ready. Do not allow residences in this flood way, which is this is consistent with this is residences, not residents. This is the oh, people yeah. can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was yeah. wondering about that. No one's going yeah. to go there. Sorry. Actually, we, we, we mean that too. But yeah. Um, if the house Freudian, is gone, the people are gone. Freudian slip. Yeah. Um. So um, <laughs> he's just looking for like a very clear statement so that it doesn't get misinterpreted anywhere. So he ding, agrees ding, that ding. it's in there, but okay. he just wants sure. Ding, ding, ding. The and the next one, too. That's um, Oh, this is a municipal ticket policy. This is an enforcement. Um, and we don't we're allowed to um, ticket on each offense and you can defend you can define the offense and debate. normally it's daily so yeah. okay right. awesome okay cool okay. Okay. so thank you very much everyone do we want to um well i think we need to in work through the details of what monroe provided and hope that map turns up um not tonight. No. no. You said it mapped. Don't cave on the slope. Oh, we had mapped. He had mapped the, the, the conformity. Oh, so. that was interesting. Don't yeah. cave on the Eric slope. says don't cave on yeah, the slope. I'm a, I'm, I, yeah, I'm right there with you. Don't cave on the slope. <laughs> no. There were many things I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, nonsense. Yeah. 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 Yeah.